I got the title, Standing Firm, the main event. And I don't know about you guys, but I, I think for me, I, I have to keep perspective. And, and I think it's just the way I think. You know, I, I kind of, I'm kind of backwards, but I, I, it's always a goal for me. My wife, you know, we get in the car. We're from California. We'll take the drive back when we take the family sometimes. And, and my wife knows, man, it, you know what? We, we, we go. It's a goal. We're getting there, and I have an 11-hour goal. If you drove to California, you know that. That means you don't go to the bathroom. You're not, we're not eating. We take food with us, and we're going to get there because that's the goal. I got to get there. Well, you know, even though we got an extra day, it don't matter. I got to get there, right? My, my, my staff knows how I think, and, and you know, whenever, um, you know, we moved into this facility, I, I, they know, you know what, Ray's a little tweaked. It's a goal, and, and you know, I, 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 one of my staff members moved to New York. I think it was the furthest place he can get away because he <laughs> We worked, you know, for six months, six days a week, and it wasn't, you know, it was 14, 16, I, I got a goal, we got to get this done. And I, you know, it, it's amazing because, you know, I come back and share, man, I just think God's doing this, and I'll tell the staff that, and, you know, I can just see their faces going, oh, no. Here we go, man. He's got, he's got something in his mind. I'll walk away, you know, some of the construction projects, I'll walk away, and I'll come back an hour later studying, and I go, hey, what are you guys doing, man? Come, this thing's not done yet. You know what I mean? I just, that's my mindset. And, and, and when it comes to eternal things, I, I think it's good for us to keep the goal in mind. I, I thought of Ebo, you know, standing there in that fight. I mean, wasn't that a cool fight, watching the end of that? And then, and then you're standing the referee, and both your hands are there, and, you know, only one of them's going up, right? There's, there, there, there's going to be a winner. There, there's going to be someone who comes out reaching the goal, that he set out to do. And it's amazing because we have a little glimpse of heaven. What God has laid out for us in his word. And I want you to turn there and I just, just kind of just kind of picture this with me in your mind. Revelations chapter 4. And, and it's probably that one spot in scripture where you just kind of go, whoa, man, I'm going to be there one day. Watch this. Revelation chapter 4. Look at verse 2. Immediately... I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads." And from the throne proceeded lightning and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And the midst of the throne, around the throne, were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature like a face, like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings full of eyes around them, within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him, who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders having uh, fallen down before him, who sits on the throne, and worshiping him who lives forever and ever, and cast their thrones before the, cast their crowns before the throne, saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and power. You were created, you created all things, and by your will, they exist and were created. I don't know about you, man, but I, I, I almost, you just kind of try to just imagine. To just imagine what that's going to be like. And yet, check this out. One day, you and I are going to be there. 
We're going to be there in that scene, in that picture, you know, and just, you know, overwhelmed by the glory and the presence of God. And, and, and I think it's important that you kind of just kind of keep that in mind, guys, as we're here in this world, right, in this world that's corrupted and, and tainted and immorality and temptation. And you, you just kind of keep in mind, one day I'm going to stand before God. One day I'm going to stand before the throne of God. In Hebrews 4, 13, it says this, And there was no creature hidden from his sight. But all things were naked and open to the eyes of him to to whom we must give an account. Everything naked, open, exposed before God. You're not going to be able to hide just this little compartment, kind of what Steve was talking about earlier. It's not going to be this little place where I go, oh, I, I, you know, I, this, this one little part, God, I really don't want. No, everything naked and open, everything exposed before God, the, the creator of all things, the one who gave his life for you, and it's all going to be there open. And I don't know about you, man, but it's, it sends chills down my spine. Just knowing that, that man, God is going to see it all. And we're going to be there before his throne. And then there's another scripture that, and I, 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 just track with me for a moment, guys, and we'll kind of get to where I'm going. But I, I want you to turn one more place with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 11 with me. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is... Jesus Christ. And if anyone builds on this foundation with gold or silver or precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. And if anyone's work which he has built on endures, he'll receive a reward. If anyone works, is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. The picture, well, it's almost like that day where you're standing there and the judge has got his hand on your arm and it's going to go, hey, you, you win. Your motives, your intent, it it was right, man. You have a reward for all of the the labor, the work that you've accomplished. I I have something for you. Can you imagine standing before God and he says, hey, you've earned a reward. And I go, man, I I didn't do nothing. (laughs) But you were faithful. You were the man of God I called you to be. And, and, and th- th- this, is, this is the thing, man. I don't think when we get to heaven, right? He says, you're going to make it, it says, but through the fire. You know, you're saved by the grace of God. Guys, not your works, not, not anything you do for God, not how great of a husband you are or how great of a dad you've been or, or what kind of servant you are in, in the church. You know what? None of that stuff is going to save you. It doesn't do that for you. But I, I, I see in Scripture that there's some kind of reward for those who are faithful here. There's something, that's, that, something to this. Paul mentioned it many times, you know, that, that you, know, you get the crown of life. You know, you get the certain crowns for, for enduring. There, there, there's certain things that, and, 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 I don't, and I don't think when you get to heaven, you're going to kind of go set up in heaven and kind of go, oh, man. What a bummer! I, you know, I, you know, happy is going to be a, a joy. Heaven's going to be a joyful place, a happy place. It's going to be somewhere where there's going to be no more sadness, no more tears, no more, no more fears. You know, you're not going to have regrets. You know, you're going to be in heaven. I don't think it's going to be somewhere you're kind of bummed out. But I do think this. I, I think your faithfulness here is going to determine your responsibility there. 
You tracking with me? What you do here, guys, is going to have eternal effects upon your life. Eternally. You see, my, my, my daughter, I think she was three or four, my, my dad, her grandpa, went out and bought her a little Barbie car. And we had a big basement, man. And, and she would, you know, Dad, I want to drive the car. And we would go down to the basement. And she would cruise in that little Barbie car, man, for hours at a time, you know, till the battery ran out. I have to plug that bad boy back in because, man, she went, didn't have enough. You know, me had tomorrow will be charging it. And as soon as that thing was charged, you know, Daddy, the, you know, it's green. That's, you know, it's ready. My daughter's 15 now. Now, now let me tell you, man, that Barbie cool, car was the coolest thing she'd ever seen. That was her capacity, right? <laughs> that was, and, and she loved it. She enjoyed it. Now, she's 15, man. I, I, I can't take her back to the Barbie car because she wants my car keys now, right? And I can't take her back to the Barbie car and just say, hey, Mia, you know, go play in that for a little while. She's past that in capacity. She, she, she you know, she, like, that, part, that was cute, Dad. I got the pictures. I got the memories. But, you know, that don't really entertain me anymore. Guys, I, I don't want to get to heaven and kind of, well, you know, you guys will be happy, content, but you're going to be kind of cruising your little Barbie car around heaven. Wow, this is cool. And they're going to go, oh, you're really having fun. That's great. But they, they, it seems like, like those who have been faithful with little will be entrusted with much. Those who have been faithful here, well, the parables, man, throughout the Scripture, Jesus would teach this, this concept, hey, you be faithful here, and I'm going to entrust you with much there. I've been faithful with, with five cities. I'm going to, I, I, I'm going to you know, with, 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 the, with, with the, the, the one pound, I'm going to entrust you over five cities. You've been faithful with the one pound, I'm going to trust you over ten cities, right? Jesus showed that in the parables, that you know what, what you do here is going to have eternal effects there. And so I ask you, man, what is your pursuit, man? What are you living for, man? What are you living your life for here? Is it, is it for success? The bigger house? The better car? I, it was cool. I was talking to Ebo in the back, and he was saying, man, you know, sometimes I, I you know, I, I was thinking I was one fight away from, you know, the big purse, man, the million, the five million dollar fight. And he goes, you know, but I, I don't know, man. If I would have got that big purse, would I be serving the Lord today? Would I ever been broken and, and in need for him? And, and then he, he sits back there and he goes, you know what? I'm glad that I didn't get the big purse if it would have took, taken me away from what God wants for me. Because I'd rather store my treasures in heaven than have all the treasures here and watch it just burn and pass away. Guys, we need, we need to live our lives for eternity, man. We need to live our lives for something that counts, something that's not going to fade away, something that's not going to be ripped off, something that's not going to, you're not going to leave to your kids and watch them squander it all. <laughs> but we're, we're living in, in the, uh, the generation where all the money is in the older generation. A lot of them are dying off. And I was reading an article the other day, and they're saying, you know, the, all these young people are waiting for mom and dad to die because, man, they know they got, you know, millions just waiting to come to their account. They're just kind of, you know, just, oh, oh, baby. I'm almost rich, right? And they're marketing to, to that generation, the, you know, those that want that money. They're marketing specifically to those guys because they're trying to think, how are we going to get that money out of their hand into ours? And you go, man, you know what? They're, they're going to go out there. They're going to get rich instantly. They're going to squander, squ squander everything that mom and dad worked for and saved for. And they're still going to be empty. And they're still going to have nothing to show for it. Not only here, but they're not going to have nothing to show for it eternally. Guys, we, we need to have an eternal perspective if we're going to fight this fight, man, with endurance. If we're going to fight this, this fight is the, for the long haul. We're, we're going to, you know, just continue remembering, you know what? I'm, I'm not living for here. I'm not living for now. I'm living my life for eternity. 
And I want to store those treasures there, man. I want to live my life for that time. Jesus said this in Luke 12, 15. He says, and Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. That was Jesus, man. He said, you know what? Be careful, man. This covetousness, this, the worldliness, the, 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 the desire for, for the temporal compared to the eternal, it's always a trap. It's always that little carrot dangling on the stick, man. And we get our eyes off the prize. We get our eyes off of eternity and we put them on the temporal. And I think it's easy, man. I think it's easy to, to get that out of, out of order. Man, let me, let me tell you something. Your number one responsibility is your relationship with God, man. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added on to you. Your number one responsibility is God. Your number two responsibility is your wife. The kids are going to grow up, and they're going to leave, and you're going to, you and your wife, that's it, man. Till death do you part, man. Number two responsibility is your wife. Number three is your children. God gave them to you to be their protector, their provider, and the one who shows them the love of Jesus Christ, their spiritual leader. God gave them to you. And num num number four, man, is, is your service to God, right? And it's in that order. I, I really, I truly believe that, man. If, if, if your family's messed up, how do you serve God? If your relationship with God's messed up, how, how do you serve him? It has to be God, your wife, your children, your service, your ministry. And, 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 and it's amazing because I think it's so easy for us as men to kind of shrug our responsibility off. Make excuses. Put it off on someone else. You know, that spiritual stuff, that's the pastor's job. That spiritual, you know, then I, I'm busy all the time. I heard this story, and it's, it's an article that came out in the paper. It was back in 2002, and I saved it. It's, it's from Italy, and let, let me just read it to you. In Milan, Italy, an Italian housewife has gone into the prayer business to recoup souls of people who daily grind leaves them no time to attend to their own salvation. For a buck fifty, Monica Bur Bilinari age 26, will say a prayer for a lost relative or perform the sign of the cross once a day. The New Paradise Agency, which, has, which she started running from her home in northern Italy, has a list of prices that go in, up to $25 for a rosary sequence of five prayers. For a more personal service, Bellinari will recite a prayer in your home for a little over 10 bucks, excluding travel costs. Bellinari told the reporter, life has become so frantic that people don't have time to do anything beyond work and family. That's why people have stopped praying even though they feel a spiritual need to do so. To drum up clients, the Paradise Agency's brochure reads this. It encourages its readers to remember they only have one soul. And if you don't have time to save it, call me. I'll take care of it for you. <laughs> That's the days we're living in. <laughs> I don't think God's going to buy it. <laughs> I don't think it's going to go over well. Hey, well, I paid that chick over there in Italy, man. <laughs> you know what? It's our responsibility. We can't pass that on somebody. You, you, you don't go and say, you know, I, I really don't got time to talk to you, babe. I, I'll send another dude to go talk to you. No, man. This responsibility between us and God, it's ours. It's ours, man. And if we're going to be the men of God, if we're, if we're, we're, we're going to fight this good fight, man, we need to stand, guys. We need to prepare for the main event. There was a time, and I, my, my mom got saved when, when I was about 11 years old. And at that time, my, my, my dad wasn't saved. My dad smoked a lot of dope. And, and I remember, you know, my mom would take me to church, and, and she started going to this charismatic movement church, man, in Southern California. And I got saved there. 
And I, I remember, man, it was, you know, they were into the charismatic thing. I spoke in tongues, and I knew it was a genuine thing, man. I, knew, I didn't know nothing about it. I was just like, whoa, man, something happened to me. And I saw my dad, and my mom would used to show us all these movies, man. You guys might remember them if you're back a little bit, the distant thunder and you know, they had all the hippie pants on, and Jesus came back. And I remember watching that stuff. And, and one night, I, just, I, sat back, I, sat, I stood home, and I told, I told Mom, you know what? Go to church. i got to talk to Dad. I, I'm 11, 12 years old. I said, man, I, I need to talk to Dad. And I want him to do it. I had a dream. And, and my dream was that m- my, my brother, my sister, Mom, and myself were in this cloud, and Jesus was on the cloud, and Dad wasn't there. And I was looking for Dad, man. I couldn't find Dad. As a little boy, I said, I, I, I got to stay home and tell Dad, man, that, that you know what? If you don't get right with God, Jesus is coming back, and he's going to get left behind. So I, I stood home that day. She went to church, and I started telling Dad, you know, and I was weeping, man. I just said, Dad, you need Jesus. And my dad said, you know what, boy? Your mom's brainwashing you. He took me into the back bathroom. We fired up a big joint, and I got stoned, man, and I, I thought I was with Jesus right there. And I liked it, man. And for the next 11 years of my life, drugs, cocaine, sex, you know, partying, that was my life. Man, I, I was basing three and a half grams of coke a day. But when I was about 14, man, I was already starting to smoke a lot of dope. And I, and I remember it like it was yesterday. Because my mom had shared the word with us. And, you know, we're watching all these movies and the rapture. And, and I, I, rem- I remember... Her telling me, you know what, man, Jesus is coming back. You better be ready, son. And me and my friends, we had just smoked the joint. We're outside shooting some baskets, just messing around. The sun was going down. And there was a big rainbow around the moon. I remember looking up, and we're just kind of like, wow, dude, check that out. And one of my friends goes, hey, isn't, this isn't say in the Bible whenever there's a rainbow around the moon? That wasn't in the Bible, but... He said, you know, doesn't it say in the Bible there's a rainbow that Jesus come back? I went, oh, no. <laughs> I ran. It was like, you know, six blocks away. I remember running, man, full speed home. I said, mom's home, I'm good. Right? <laughs> if mom's home. <laughs> I remember opening up that door. I remember running to the kitchen and, and, and on the stove, there was a water boiling over the top. And I'm running to every house in the room, Mom, Mom, Mom. And nowhere, man. The fire was on. The, the, you know, dinner was being cooked. And, and it was empty. And I, I remember just this, this numbness going through me. I walked over to the couch, and I just began to weep, weep. I missed it. Missed it. I'm already, I'm already now in my mind, I'm planning, man. I, you know, head to the mountains, live on berries for the next seven years, brother. You know, I, I'm not taking the mark. I, you know, I was, this stuff was already, you know, spinning, man. And then mom opens the door. <laughs> What's the matter? Nothing. <laughs> I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> At that time, man, I thought I, I thought I missed a chance. It didn't change me. <laughs> it took another seven, eight years before God finally, nine years later, before God finally broke me. And I, man, I was so messed up. And 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 I, I remember sitting at a, a very, you know, in a venue, man, a church setting, and 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 I just snuck in the back door. God had spoke to my heart, go to church that night. I'd been fighting God for a long time. And I remember walking into that door and sitting in the back row. No one knew I was there. Mom didn't know I was there. She was in the front row. I was in the back row. I snuck in late. And it was like no one else was in the room. It was just, man, Pastor Raw just speaking to my heart. And I remember just going, how in the world does he know all this stuff about me? It was God, man. It was God. And I gave my life to, to the Lord 20, when I was 23 years old, almost, uh, man, 20 years ago now. 19 years ago, and, I, and I, I remember from that point on, I remember thinking, you know what, I, I don't ever want to be caught off guard again. I want to be ready. When my master comes, 
when my Savior shows up, man, I, I want to stand there, and I want to just say, man, God, I lived my life for you. I gave it all. I, I, I've lived for this day, the goal, the prize. I, I, I want, to, I, I, that's the day that I'm living my life for, guys. That, that's the day that, that I, I, over and over in my mind, I, I, I play it through my head. I'm living for that day. Check this out. I, I want you to turn with me. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, and then we're going to go to one of the parables. But you see, see, Paul the apostle, he got a glimpse of heaven, guys. Remember, remember where he said, Man, I I I, I tell you about a guy who who saw the third heaven, man. And he says, I was there once. I got there. I, I, I got a, a picture of what it was. And from that day, Paul lived radically for the kingdom of God. He didn't care if he was in prison. He, he, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't going to stop doing what he was doing because he now saw the prize. He saw heaven. And he said, you know what, I can't even explain it to you. All I can tell you, man, is that I want to get there. And he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, he says, do you not know that those who run in the race all run, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you obtain it, and everyone who competes for the prize is, is temporal in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not, not with uncertainty, thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be come disqualified. Man, this is a guy who's seen it. He, he saw the prize. He said, you know what? I'm going to live my life for that. I want to live my life for the prize. And, and, and he went to extents. He, we, he says, you know what? The, the world, they're doing it for a, a perishable crown. And we've all heard the analogy, man. They, the, the winner of the games in the days of Paul, they would, they would receive a, a little crown of leaves that would fade away very quick. And anything that you live your life for in this world, it's just like that, man. It's going to fade away really quick. And he said, you know what? I, I, I fight for an imperishable crown. I'm fighting for a, a crown that doesn't fade away. It's not temporal. It's eternal. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's, it's not wasted with time. It's not wasted with, with, with the events of this world. He says, man, I, I'm, I'm going to fight, and I don't want to be disqualified from this fight. I don't want to be put on some shelf, just kind of watching in my little Barbie doll cruising around happy. I, I want to go for it, man. I want to go for it because I, I, I want to win the prize. I, I want to I, I, I obtain what God has for my life. And let me tell you something, man. God has a plan for your life. He wants to do amazing things. He wants to use you to touch your own family members, to touch your friends, to, be, to, to affect your neighborhoods, to your children, your wife, your community. But it, it, it takes a life that says, God, I'm not going to live for this world. I'm going to live for the eternal. I'm going to lay it down. You see, 15 years ago, when God was calling me to Belen, I was living in Southern California. I was born in Belen, but raised in Southern California. And Belen was my, it, it was my Africa, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, Lord, if I get saved, I know you're just going to send me to Africa. I'm not going to surrender. And I, I remember, man, coming to Belen, and I, was, it, I knew the Lord had called me, but somehow I was kicking and screaming getting here, man. I, you know, I <laughs> They're really, growing up, man, a teenager, mom and dad were going to go to vacation to New Mexico, and I meant Belen, and, and, and man, I, I would make excuses. I don't want to go, man. You know, there's more, there's nothing to do there. Rope lizards. I mean, come on. <laughs> what are you going to do? I mean, I, and, and, you know, sure enough, God, you know, I just finally said, God, I surrender, man. I, I, I don't know what you want in my life. I'm a, I'm a messed up druggie. I, I, I've, I've wasted and squandered everything you've given me. 
And, and I mean, what, what would you want me for anyway? And he just put this burden for Belen, New Mexico on my heart, for the Rio Grande Valley. And, and guys, I stand in awe 15 years later to see what God is doing here, man. I'm blown away. Blown away. Never expected to see what God is doing in, in little community that we're in and to see the lives that are being changed, the hearts that are being changed, what God's doing. But you know what? All it was was just saying, God, I, I don't want to live for this world, man. I want to live for eternity. It doesn't matter, man. The things of this world don't matter. Wherever you want me, that's where I want to go. And if it's Africa, then so be it. If it's Berlin, well, okay. <laughs> I want to live my life for, for eternal things now. I, I, want to, I want to live my life for the prize. I, I want to shoot for the crown, man. I want to live my life. I want to spend it every way I can for the kingdom of God because I want to get to heaven one day and I want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Servant. You see, that's what he's called us to be, to be servants, man, to lay down our own lives. And, and, and most of you know, servant means slave. No rights. Not your will anymore. Not your agendas anymore. Now it's my agenda for you. Now it's, it, it's me putting people in your life to serve them, to bless them. And in doing so, well, I want you to tur turn with me here. It's Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Verse 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately went on a journey. Jesus telling a parable. It's a picture. It's, it's an illustration. It's Jesus saying, hey, hey, let me tell you what happened here. Well, I, th this, this master, this man traveling to a far country called his servants. He called his servants. He said, hey, I'm going to entrust to you these Talents. Some one he gave five, to one he gave two, and to another one he gave one, each according to their own ability. You see, God's not going to give you more than you can handle. He'll give you what your abilities are. And I really think those talents, even though in the text here it's speaking of uh, uh, monetary responsibility, it's talking about a monetary amount here. And, and I believe God has given to you not only this time, but He's given you your, your talent, He's given to you your, your gifts. And he's entrusted to them, you t them with you, to you. He says, hey, hey, this is your ability, and I, I'm giving this to you, and one day I'm going to come back, and, and I, you're going to give an account for what I've given to you. And think about it, guys. To every one of us here, man, if you're a Christian here this, this afternoon, God has entrusted to you the time you have your finances, and your family. He's trusted you with those things. He says, hey, here, here, one of you may only have two, one, one of you has five, one, only one, but you know what? I'm leaving that with you until I come back. You're responsible. Watch it. Check it out. Next verse, it's verse 16. Then he who had received the five talents went and he traded with them, made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received the two talents, two more also. But he who had received one went and he, and he dug it in the ground and he hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So when he had received he who had received the five talents came and he, and he brought five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I, I've gained five more talents 
besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Wow. Hey, the one who had five, he said, man, you know what? I'm going to invest that five. I, I, want, I, I want when my Lord comes back, I want to have something, not just the five he gave me. I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to use it for his glory. I want to live my life, man, for, for my master's glory. And he says when his master came back, he only not had the five, but he had five more. And he said, look, 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 look what, I, look what I've done with what you gave me. And his master said, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you've been faithful with the little. Guys, you understand that what we're dealing with down here is the little? Compared to eternity, <laughs> this is the little, man. We're, we're, you know, it's the Barbie doll car. Really, man, we're just dealing with little things here. But if you're faithful with the little things here, God's going to entrust you with much there. And you know what blows my mind? Is the guy with the five talents, well, he didn't get any greater accommodations or, or, or pats on the back from the Lord than the guy with the two talents. It's only with what God's entrusted to you that you're going to be accountable for. It doesn't, you know, I, I can't keep my eyes on what God's doing with someone else. i got to keep my eyes with what God has given me. i got the two talents. I want to be faithful with the two. Someone else might have the five talents and, and what God's doing and, and, you know, other ministries and other men. I, you know, I stand back and go, man, that's awesome. That's cool. God gave them five talents and they're being faithful with the five. Man, I want to be faithful with my two. Because <laughs> when my Lord comes, it's not going to be any different for them than it's going to be for me. Because it really doesn't depend upon how big your ministry is or, or how wide a range your are serving. It matters what did you do with what God gave you. What did you do with what God gave you? Check it out. The next guy, he, he, verse 20. Actually, it's further down. Verse 22. He also had received the two talents, came, and he said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, well, done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Oh, man, the, the two, the five. It, it, from God's perspective, it wasn't any different. Man, I'm going to make you rule over many things. Because you were faithful to what I gave you here. And guys, there's no, no excuses, man. I don't think there's going to be any excuse. You're not going to, you're going to go, hey, the chicken Italy. You're not, it's not going to work. My wife, she prayed a lot. It's not going to work for you. <laughs> what did you do, man? Faithful to your God? Faithful to your wife? Faithful to your children? Faithful to serving God with what he's entrusted to you? Man, that's all that really, that's what you're going to give an account for. That's what I'm going to give an account for one day. Well, there was one servant left. Well, notice with me verse Verse 34, verse 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I, I knew you to be a, a hard man reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. I was afraid. Oh, yeah, I, I knew that, that you were going to give, you were going to call me to the table. I know I was going to have to give an account. So rather than using anything for your glory, what I did is I just kind of buried it. I didn't use it. I didn't invest it. I, 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 all I did was just, well, I'm giving you back what you gave me, Lord. You, you gave me all these talents. You gave me all of this responsibility. And, well, I still have it. Here. What was God's response to that? Well, check it out. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and you lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers at my 
coming, I would have received my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. Wow. So even that, which was, with, you know, that one that he had, he said, man, take that away from him. Through the fire. Saved by the fire. It's by God's grace you're saved. I know that. You know that, guys. I'm, I'm not talking about some work trip on, on you. I'm telling you this, man. Live your life for the prize. Live your life for the goal. Let's do that together, man. They, 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 let's, let's get to heaven. And Well, you see, my daughter, she, she's 15. She, she wants to... I don't want to just drive a little truck, but I, I want a race car. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I want to go for it, man. I, I, I want the baddest, the big. I, I just, man, I, I just want to spend my life for eternal things because I know all of this, guys, it's going to fade away. Yeah, I, and, and probably sooner than we think or probably sooner than we hope. But I believe Jesus is coming, man. He's coming soon. Guys, it's all set up. It's all ready. Jesus is coming back. How do you want him to find you when he comes? Busy? Doing his father's business? I hope. Amen? Man, let's get busy, man. The right priority, living our lives for the right things. Man, we have to work. I know that. We got to provide for our families. But you know what? That's not... That, that, that's, that's the necessity, man, but the priority, Jesus Christ and him crucified, living through us.